Right now, we're talking to John Payne, our old friend John Payne, who is executive director and treasurer of Show Me Cannabis, which is an organization dedicated to overturning the current prohibition on marijuana. Now, what caught my eye was this piece you wrote for the American Conservative magazine not too long ago. It was actually a book review, but you were talking about the militarization of the police, which is a topic that we've covered a number of times on this program. Uh, maybe you can give us a little bit of the, an overview of this, because your take on this had a lot to do anyway with the drug war, because the book you're talking about had to do with the militarization of the police, but you were connecting the dots the way the author did to, to note that this didn't just occur spontaneously, this is just sort of an oddball feature of American police that they happen to be militarized, but there, happens, there seems like there's some connection between this and the war on drugs. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Radley Balco is the guy who uh, wrote That's the book, right. and he's That's right. yeah, he's he's been working on this uh, for some time. And you know, he's uh, he started out, I believe, at the Cato Institute, and now he's actually at the Washington Post. So he's uh, you know actually a part of the mainstream media now, which is uh, kind of exciting. I've long thought that he's the most important journalist working because he's uh, exposing all these atrocious police raids that are happening, oftentimes to people that have done absolutely nothing wrong. They actually have the wrong house, and they're busting in and terrorizing the occupants uh and he's done he's been documenting this for probably about a decade now uh and in the book he talks about that there's been there are now about 50,000 SWAT raids in this country every year and the way that we got here was that back in the 70s and then more in the 80s when Reagan ratcheted up the drug war uh they started giving away military equipment to police departments they started giving grants to enforce drug laws. The more arrests you can show, the more money you can get from the federal government, specifically for drugs. Uh, you know, if you arrest more people for robbery, rape, murder, that doesn't that doesn't register for federal grants. But if you arrest a lot of people for pot, then they will give you a big chunk of money. Uh, that that was uh, through burn grants and also the cops grants. And so these sorts of things uh, are what have driven people, driven departments to sort of focus on drug offenses and to enforce them in such a heavy-handed manner. Radley doesn't talk about this as much in his book, but I know a, a chief of police, he, he opposes police militarization as well, and he works sort of out in the St. Louis exurbs out in Lincoln County here in Missouri. And I've talked to him a fair amount about this, and he, he says that uh, one thing that Radley is missing, though, is that the culture of policing changed in the 70s and 80s as well. They started hiring a lot of guys coming out of the military after Vietnam, and this is a trend that just sort of kept up, and they didn't ever try to enforce the idea that the military and policing are two very different things, yeah. because if you go out there and you're in the military, your job is to blow things up, essentially, uh, whereas the job of a policeman is to keep the peace. Uh, you're not supposed to be provoking violence. You're supposed to be defusing it. So it's a really, a really different job, and a lot of people don't understand that, even people who work in that field. And so that's another problem that needs to be addressed. But is a lot of this police militarization and a lot of these tactics, like the use of SWAT teams, etc., are these really being directed at pot users, or wouldn't this be directed at drug kingpins somewhere? I mean, I could imagine the average American maybe more and more thinking, well, you know, maybe the, maybe marijuana isn't so harmful after all, or there's so many people who want to use it, there's no point in trying to lock them all up, but we got to go get those heroin dealers because heroin makes you drive crazy and go out and want to murder people. So in other words, I can imagine that there are some people who are moving a little bit closer to a libertarian view on marijuana, but maybe still are wary about the harder drugs. But are you saying that a lot of these tactics that make us uncomfortable that the police are using are not really discriminating between types of drugs. They're, they're just as likely to, to go and bother somebody who's got, you know, two joints as they are somebody uh, in heroin and harder drugs? Uh, well, you know, I, I don't know about two joints. They, they probably wouldn't execute a search warrant if that's all they thought a person had, but uh, I will say that they get it wrong a lot. Uh, so it doesn't really matter sometimes what they're what they're pursuing, uh, because if they go to the wrong house, <laughs> then it, it's going to be a bad situation. Yeah. Uh, one of the more famous examples was that in uh, Atlanta, police had uh, been tipped off by a confidential informant that there was drugs being dealt out of this house in a pretty bad neighborhood, and they didn't do any anything to check out the confidential informant statement. 
and they just raided the house. And the house turned out to belong to, I can't remember her exact age, but she was a very old woman, Catherine Johnston. Uh, and she didn't know what was going on, so she grabbed a little pistol that she had uh, for self-defense because she lives in a bad neighborhood. I mean, I, you know, if you <laughs> live in a place like that, it certainly makes sense to have a gun. And you know, when the police started busting down her door, she fired. She didn't know it was the police. Uh, and then they responded with just a, an absolute hail of bullets. And uh, when they figured out that this is not the person, this is clearly, <laughs> this lady is not selling drugs. Uh, what they did is they attempted to plant drugs uh, and let her bleed to death on the floor. That is an extreme example, of course, but they've had a number of these wrong door raids. Uh, one, one of them in Columbia, Missouri, where the University of Missouri is located, they thought this guy had a larger amount of marijuana than he did. When they got in, he basically did have, he had less than two joints. He had a grinder with some marijuana residue in it, uh, and that's all they found in the guy's house. And they busted him down his door and shot his dogs. That's the one where Charles Crothammer said that, oh, well, this is just sort of the collateral damage of the drug war. This doesn't happen that often. But it's not that that doesn't happen. It's that very few police departments actually record their police raids. So it's just very rare that we actually see that happen. I want to talk about a piece that you actually sent along to me just a few minutes ago. And the the headline, this is, this is from the news leader. Uh, this is out of Springfield, Missouri. Concerns aired at council meeting about police-guard partnership, and it's a proposed agreement with the Missouri National Guard, between the Missouri National Guard and the police, to work together in waging the drug war. Now, tell us about that. Yeah, this is a proposal that was just made last week, and they uh, they heard it at the council meeting on Monday, so last night. And the police chief is now saying that, oh, it's just going to be a guy from the National Guard consulting with us on our drug raids and executing search warrants. But the thing is, is that the proposal includes use of aerial surveillance, and it does say that the National Guard's people shouldn't be armed when they're helping the Springfield Police Department out. But nevertheless, if you give people the power to use military equipment and to use military surveillance for domestic law enforcement, we are now talking about having the, the military enforcing domestic law. You know, in my review, I talk about how that's the main thing that the colonists revolted against the British for is that they were using the military to enforce domestic law and imposing them upon the civilian population. So it is not inaccurate to say that that is trending towards a police state. It may not be actually a police state just yet, but it's <laughs> that's where it's headed. That's still likely to pass, I think, but I do think that because of the opposition that showed up, they are likely to strip out the part about the aerial surveillance uh, because they say that that's, they don't really need that. Uh, but if they don't need it, then I don't have it in the bill. So I think that's, uh, I'm hopeful that they'll at least take that part out. But there is no need to have the National Guard come in and enforce these laws. Uh, we actually had an ordinance that we were supporting down there back in 2012 that would have decriminalized possession of small amounts of marijuana. And that's the way the law works in St. Louis and Columbia. They, at the time, the city council said, oh, we don't actually consider this to be a top priority as it is, so we don't really need to change the, the law around it. Well, if it's not a top priority, then why do you need the military to come in and help yeah. you enforce the law?